few of things um, to recognize is that, for example, psoriasis is something that you definitely will see very commonly. It's one of the most common immune-mediated diseases um, in the U.S. And when you look at the breakdown in terms of the demographics for psoriasis, it affects Caucasians a bit disproportionately, so 3.6%. And then Asians and blacks, uh, a little lower than that in terms of the prevalence. When we think about the different treatment targets for psoriasis in terms of biologics, and therefore the pathogenesis of this condition, it's really important um, to note that there's both the Th1 pathway as well as the Th17 pathway. Now, if you think about which one of those pathways is most important for psoriasis, I think the field has really shifted its thinking. Uh, we used to think it's more Th1 based, but now it's more Th17 based. And when we look at both of these pathways, you'll see that there are different medications that affect different parts of the pathway. So if we were to go from upstream to downstream, for example, you can see the different biologics affect various uh, different uh, areas. And this is a nice summary slide that talks about the various targets um, uh, in psoriasis pathogenesis and where the biologics hit. And we'll go over a little bit of that in more detail in the later slides. Okay, so what is the overall treatment approach for plaque psoriasis? When we think about a patient in front of us with plaque psoriasis, naturally we will first take a look at their skin. However, one of the first questions I challenge you to ask yourselves is actually ask, is psoriatic arthritis present? And the reason for that is that if a patient has psoriatic arthritis, then you may go down the pathway of selecting a systemic medication, even though they may have just 1% body surface area. So let's take the scenario that they don't have psoriatic arthritis, and we'll talk about how to screen for psoriatic arthritis. Let's say they have skin only psoriasis and doesn't have any joint disease. Then you want to take a look to see if the patient has mild disease or if they have moderate to severe. If they have mild disease, typically defined as those with less than 3 to 5% of the body surface area, then our treatments will be more targeted in terms of either targeted phototherapy, less frequently now, or topical therapy. Now, if their psoriasis is more moderate to severe, so what is moderate to severe? And this is a definition that's actually being debated over uh, many years now. Nowadays, thinking about you know, probably greater than 5% of the body surface area or special areas in that may be involved, so the scalp, the intertriginous areas, the palms and soles. Most payers, however, typically define uh, the body surface area still as 10% or greater, just so that, um, that you know. So if you decide the patient has moderate to severe psoriasis, then you want to go to one of the systemic therapies. And you have three different classes to think about concurrently. So they can be the biologics. They, so they can be the biologics, they can be the oral medications, or phototherapy. At the current time, I would say probably the biologics and the oral therapies are the most commonly used. And then people may supplement that with phototherapy. How many of you have phototherapy where you are? Okay, so some of you do. And now let's take the scenario that they have joint disease and you decide that, you either in concert with a rheumatologist, uh, decide that it's PSA, it's active PSA. Then in those cases, it doesn't matter if they only have one small patch of psoriasis and they have, but if they have active joint disease, then you want to go to one of the systemic medications. So you actually want to go to a biologic or an oral medication that would adequately treat their joint at the same time that would treat their um, psoriasis as well. All right, so let's look at screening for psoriatic arthritis. Uh, one of the mnemonics that I like is PSA because it's super easy to remember. So P is pain for joint, pain, pain in the joint or the back. S is stiffness, that is morning stiffness in the joints or swelling in the joints. So you want to ask them after they wake up in the morning, do they feel stiffness in their joints for more than 30 or 40 minutes? And if they say they do, then you may have a patient who may have early signs of psoriatic arthritis. You do want to um, consider those older patients who, you know, they may say, well, I have 
paint here and I have a little stiffness here. In the older population, the differential diagnosis would be a little bit broad because they may have osteoarthritis. Um, so you want to examine them carefully uh, in that case. And then axial disease, so if they have stiffness in the, in the spine for a long period of time. All right, so let's think about our FDA-approved biologics for psoriasis. So typically, we think about them in terms of the different classes. So we have our TNF inhibitors, and as you can see, include etanercept, infliximab, one of the uh, first, among the first approved biologics, uh, TNF inhibitors. We have adalimumab, and we also have sertilizumab. We're gonna talk about some of these specific uses of TNF inhibitors in the uh, panel a, a, little, a little later on to talk about some of the differentiation among them. And then we have our, in this class, sort of in the class of its own, it's a P40 IL-12-23 antagonist eustachinumab. Now, eustachinumab, um, it's in a class of its own because it inhibits the P40 subunit which is shared by IL-12 as well as IL-23. Sometimes you'll also see it classified under the IL-23 antagonist as well because it also inhibits IL-23. Following that, we have our class of IL-17 inhibitors. And so this is where you have ixekizumab, secukinumab, and brodalumab. And then finally, our uh, IL-23 inhibitors where you have gaselkumab, rizinkizumab, and tildrakizumab. One thing to note is that all of these medications uh, are approved for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis with the exception of two. So you have brodalumab, which is only approved for psoriasis, but also has a PSC indication outside of the United States. You also have tildrakizumab, which is approved for psoriasis only. If you have a patient, for example, who has Medicare only, um, you may consider tildrakizumab as one of the options. The reason is because it goes under their uh, medical benefit uh, instead of their pharmacy benefit. So just um, a tip there for, for this. All right, so how do you choose a biologic, right? So that's the million dollar question. And when you look at the patients in front of you, they're all very different, and they may respond differently to different biologics. And so this is a one way, a one framework that will kind of help get you oriented with regards to how to make a choice in terms of the class in, in the first place. So let's first talk about TNF inhibitors. So TNF inhibitors has been the workhorse for psoriasis for a very long time. However, in terms of their efficacy in the skin, with the exception of infliximab, which has to be infused, most TNF inhibitors in terms of the efficacy is a bit more muted compared to our IL-17 and our, our IL-23 class. So, however, they really shine in terms of psoriatic arthritis. They do really well for people uh, with PSA, both in the peripheral joints as well as uh, axial joints. If you have a patient who is thinking about family planning in terms of pregnancy or breastfeeding, then sertralizumab would be the drug of choice there are actually data that have shown sertilizumab um, is safe during pregnancy, not pulled across the placenta to affect the fetus, and also not present in uh, breast milk. When to avoid TNF inhibitors. So you want to avoid TNF inhibitors in patients with a history of demyelinating disease, so patients with a history of MS, for example. And those with hepatitis B, you may want to choose another medication because there is a risk of reactivation for their hepatitis B. And then also TNF inhibitors are not preferred in certain patient subtypes. You may not have a choice based on their insurance coverage or so forth, uh, but TNF inhibitors are not quite preferred in those with a history of latent TB due to the potential risk of reactivation. They're not preferred and this is a soft non-preference in patients with advanced CHF. Um, most of that data comes from infliximab data. But overall, if you have a patient who have CHF um, and it's early stage CHF, in general, it's still accepted and, you can, and, and their insurance only allow them to use, for example, some type of TNF inhibitors, then it's okay as well. So not a strict contraindication on the bottom, um, uh, but something to, to consider possibly other agents. 
All right. So IL-17 inhibitors, and I list all the medications underneath as well. So um, IL-17 inhibitors. So they actually, as a class, have very robust uh, both the skin efficacy as well as joint efficacy. And when you look at our IL-17 inhibitors, um, both the secukinumab and ixekizumab are, uh, they are a monthly dosing. And then, um, then you have brodalumab, which, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, every two week dosing. So, and so they're, so they're great in the skin, they're great in the joints. Um, you do want to avoid them in those with a history, personal history of inflammatory bowel disease. Because in some patients with a history of inflammatory bowel disease, um, their IBD can be exacerbated by the use of IL-17 inhibitors. Some other considerations is oral candidiasis. To date, there have been actually very few cases of uh, low, very low rates of oral candidiasis with our currently approved IL-17 inhibitors. And if you, they do occur, typically they're not a reason for discontinuing um, the IL-17 inhibitor. So if you do have a patient uh, who experienced oral candidiasis, you may want to consider oral fluconazole. I usually like oral fluconazole a little bit better than just topical treatment, which if you did that, it, it may, you may have to do it five, the patient may have to do it five times a day, which can be quite uh, inconvenient. But you can do oral fluconazole, 200 milligrams a day for about three to five days, and typically that will resolve the, uh, the oral candidiasis. All right, what about our IL-23 class of medications? They're listed below here. So they, as a group, also have very robust uh, both skin efficacy, and many of them are approved for psoriatic arthritis. So gaselcumab, rizinkizumab, and ustekinumab. And something also to note for your patients is that they are quite convenient with regards to dosing. So now we're looking at every two months dosing or every three months dosing. So the patients really like that. I think in an area where you need a bit greater evidence is probably um, the effect of IL-23 inhibitors on spine disease, on, on axial psoriatic arthritis. How well do they relieve pain for patients with axial psoriatic arthritis? All right, so this is kind of a general framework uh, in terms of choosing a biologic. A uh, few things, there are four biologics that are approved in our pediatric population, and they're etanercept, which is approved for uh, children age four and above, ustekinumab, which is approved for six and above, and we also have secukinumab and ixekizumab, which is also approved for uh, children six and above. So if you're looking at a pediatric patient, um, I think those would work quite well. Um, and if you have a pediatric patient who, you know, who isn't needlephobic as a pediatric patient, right? Um, Ustekinumab has the, the most infrequent dosing among the, them, uh, but also the, but the efficacy for, for, for um, ixekizumab and as well as secukinumab are, are really, are, are very good. So sometimes I look at the, the patient, the age of the patient, then determine which medication that I wanna go with a biologic in that population. All right, laboratory monitoring. And so this one, the field has evolved quite a bit, and I know we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, in detail later, and you get a kind of variety of what, what people do. Uh, but this is the AAD MPF recommendation at baseline, TB, CBC, CMP, hepatitis B and C. There are a number of other things you may wanna check at your discretion. Ongoing is TB, currently TB only for most of our biologics. Um, uh, for those who are uh, uh, ongoing yearly for those who are taking TNF inhibitors and those who are at high risk. So people who may travel to endemic areas, people who may um, be in contact with folks who are uh, going to TB endemic areas. Now, some payers will still require you to do yearly TB with IL-17 and IL-23 inhibitors, but the guidelines actually do not require you to do that, nor, nor does a package insert require you to do that. So if you don't do that, then you may want to make sure um, you still want to uh, uh, do a, a TB screening with regards to your questionnaire. All right, so what if your standard dose doesn't work? How many of you has, has this happened to? You give them a biologic, the standard dose doesn't work. Okay, so let's say you wanna say, you wanna consider dose escalation. Now, few things. 
In the theoretical world, you can dose escalate easily, but we uh, are operating in the real world, there can actually be a lot of challenges for dose escalation. So the one that's easiest to dose escalate is probably adalimumab. Uh, in fact, about 25 to 30 percent of the prescriptions for adalimumab uh, that's written uh, for psoriasis is, is for dose escalated dosing. For the other medications, it takes a little bit more work, uh, but it can be worth it. Um, and there are studies uh, looking at secukinumab, for example, uh, as well as uh, other, other uh, biologics where it shows escalated dosing can work actually a lot better for many of our patients. So how do you dose escalate? So in most cases, the strategy for dose escalation is actually to shorten the interval between injections, okay? So for example, I'll use adalimumab as an example. FDA approved dosing is 40 milligrams every two weeks. So if it's not working, instead of doing 80 milligrams every two weeks, you wanna do 40 milligrams every week. Why? Because that allows for a more constant drug level in the body and the patients are a bit better controlled. So when you look at the guidelines, it's nearly always, that's typically the strategy that's taken with almost all of the medications, and is to shorten the interval between the injections, and then give the same dose um, at each injection. Okay, now let's talk about switching of biologics. Um, how many of you have heard the concept of primary failure versus secondary failure? Okay, so a little bit. Um, so primary failure is someone who you put on the biologic and they sort of surprise you a little bit in that they, their psoriasis didn't really budge much at all. And so primary failure technically defined as a patient who has never responded optimally to a biologic. Now most of the cases, um, especially if you're putting them on the IL-17 or IL-23 inhibitor, I might start to question the diagnosis of psoriasis in the first place because those drugs are so effective that they typically would respond somewhat, okay? And so if you're not sure, biopsy the patient. And I think Dr. Cohen also alluded to the fact that there are, you know, the, the more you know, the more you don't, then you realize the more you don't know. And you see these mixed phenotypes and, you know, sometimes when you biopsy them and they, you still don't get a satisfactory answer. And so what happens is that um, then you start to do this kind of therapeutic trial, right? How many of you have put a patient on like, you know, a biologic for psoriasis and they didn't work and you switch them and still didn't work and then you put them on dupilumab and then it worked. You're like, oh, maybe this person is actually more TH2 based pathology, right? Or vice versa. So, um, so don't hesitate to biopsy, even though sometimes it cannot, may not be that helpful, but at least uh, you can um, also assess to make sure they don't have something like cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, which can look very similar to psoriasis, and which would be terrible if they get a biologic because that's just adding fuel to a potential cancer. Okay, now let's assume you decide that the patient has bona fide psoriasis and that they did not respond much, right? They did not budge much. Typically, for me, I wait about six months to switch. Um, the reason is because if I put them, if I think I put them on the best biologic to start with, you probably go through a lot of work to get them there. And you also know when you look at the response curve, it starts to taper off, right? Plateau around six months of time, which means there are always going to be some cohort of lay bloomers that don't respond until a little bit later on. So I wouldn't actually switch them too early. In fact, every time I start a biologic with a patient, I say, we probably have to try this for about a year to see how you really do, right? So to kind of set their expectation so that they don't call me two months later and say, it's not working, switch. You're like, well, no, we haven't waited long enough. So I usually wait at least six months, but if they really didn't respond, then I will consider a six months period because that's when the curves start to, start to flatten out to get them ready for a different biologic if they have psoriasis, or add oral therapy or add phototherapy. All right, and then, then your question is what to switch to. So in those patients, I will switch to a different class because maybe IL-23 is not the right class for them, or maybe IL-17 is not the right class for them. 